Hello everyone, and welcome to Level With Me. Um, this oh, That's a little bit loud. Let me bring that down. There's that a little bit better. That kind of works. <clears throat> uh, welcome to Level With Me. This is my show where I play through games and talk about what I think the level design is doing. And uh, today we are doing basically the last stream of the year for me, just because uh, I have to go on hiatus. I will be... Uh, as I've announced on Twitter, I'm moving to New Zealand, so uh, I kind of have to devote my time and energy to figuring out how to do that. So um, unfortunately, um, that involves curtailing some of my other projects, like this stream. So this will probably be the last stream uh, of 2020. Hopefully we come back out in 2021 and it'll be okay. Uh, and I thought, you know, a game like Paradise Killer, uh, which is like a trendy mystery walking simulator game about the end of the world, I thought that would be like a nice stream to go out on. So uh, let's look into it. Oh, hello, Max. Hello, Kiri Joe. Um, I'm just going to... I've actually played through uh, Paradise Killer and completed it, uh, but... Um, you know, I thought I think I'll just do like a new game maybe. Uh so we can see what what's all about what it's all about. Let me just make sure the music's a little bit low. There we go. Uh okay. Paradise Killer. Um so Paradise Killer is by uh Kaizen. <laughs> They are, I believe, a team of two, and uh, I believe there's. They hired one person, Rachel Noy, who I follow, uh, as the main, their main like artist person. So it's basically three people made a pretty big open world game, uh, which is pretty impressive. So when we're talking about the level design here, I mean, you know, I'll have you know. Um, random uh you know critiques and nitpicks and i mean i'll have a lot of that but just keep in mind it was made by three people that's pretty impressive i can't imagine doing all this work just among three people um it also means this playthrough will be a little bit strange uh i, I think you know if most most of you playing paradise killer will be stopping to read a lot of stuff um, I will be doing minimal reading and talking, so I'll be mostly focusing on the world and level design in this playthrough. So again, you'll probably, if you actually want to play Paradise Killer, you should probably actually like buy it and support your local indies and, and then you'll actually get to see what the dialogue is. Um, but for now, let's just enjoy the, what we have here. Okay, so first of all, we start in this. So the general art style of Paradise Killer can be described as like, um, you know, uh, Vaporwave, Dreamcast, um, but also kind of like demonic. It's kind of like demonic Dreamcast, Vaporwave, but also like kind of gay and campy as well. Um, it's all of these wonderful things. Uh, and I think what draws a lot of people to Paradise Killer is their their like general art direction and environment design, where it's just very, very unusual for games to have something like this. On Instagram, this kind of aesthetic where it's like beautiful white box with like gold and house plants everywhere, that's kind of common for like outside of video game space. But inside the video game space, this is like pretty new, I think, still. Um, how did I hear about this game? Asked Quasi Otter. Um, I heard about it from people talking about it on Twitter. So, um, ooh, look at this environmental storytelling. There's a picture of where we were exiled, and we've been exiled for th exiled for three million days. Uh, oh, that's us. That's a portrait of me. Oh man, 
And then just look at that, like, like all the environment design in this is just so like, like the statues and the character design are just very, very good. Uh, I'm just going to kind of speed through the tutorial, but again, you know, if you want to play, you should probably like read through everything. I wish I could skip dialogues in this game, but I guess that's not the point. Okay, so this is our bedroom, but now um, that demon was just telling us that we're like being called up out of exile to return to the city. Um, so this is where we've been exiled. Not a bad place to be exiled, actually, right? Um, we just got all these, you know, crystal skulls everywhere, you know, as you do. Um, yeah, the art in general here is, I think, I mean, a lot of people rightly appreciate, like, the general, like, aesthetic where it's, like, skulls. Purple, yellow, trims, uh, plants everywhere. Like, it looks like a really cool, like, like, fat, like a Gucci store, like some kind of fancy fashion place. Um, but I think what also contributes to that is kind of the, the way they're using materials and shaders here. Like, everything here has so much, um, screen space like reflection stuff on here to a, to the extent that you would normally never see that much in games um and everything is just super clean so like everything feels i think like a 90s render a little bit so this vaporwave kind of in dreamcast feeling yeah sure that's there but i think what really like carries it to that last like five percent of that aesthetic is really just the way they treat materials and lighting here where it does look like 90s cg to a certain extent where um it's not that much poly like polygon detail it's just like a lot of dense objects spaced apart with flat stretches of blankness so um yeah people are saying in the chat that it's really good use of like asset store kind of unreal aesthetic and i think i would agree with that right where even if you know there's like really annoying discourse going on right now in games about like asset store flips and gamers are like upset about asset store uh, about heavy use of assets uh purchase assets from stores um but Really, that just what game what they're actually complaining about though is the instances where you can tell that it's just yeah, like an unmodified asset, right? Um, here, a lot of these I think might be just store bought assets because it's impossible for three people to have built all of the open world we're going to enter right now, but still, it's the way you personalize it, it's the way you integrate assets that's what really matters, and I think Paradise Killer. Like, you can see, like, the artist is super resourceful. They focused on the stuff that was important to hand make, and then they bought and downloaded everything else, which is exactly what you should do. Um, I should probably walk over here. Um, yeah, it's kind of like, yeah, found objects, found sculpture in a way. Um, what do I have to do? I think I have to pick up all these objects. Yeah, who doesn't want to be like a gay marble girl? A gay crystal warrior? A gay anime crystal warrior? I mean, gay anime is kind of redundant. Let's be honest, gay people own anime at this point. It's not... What the hell? Oh, and then there's, there's this like Metal Gear Solid, like... <laughs> like, uh... Like Kodak call. Um, I don't think they reuse this screen ever again, actually. It's just for this se intro sequence. <laughs> Investigate. Uh, the door to truth will open. Time to breathe life back into paradise. 
Uh, okay, and then I believe we have to use this, and then solve a little puzzle, and then we'll be making our way down there to the open world. Um, not a fan of this puzzle. I mean, I, I get that it's like a just a little like activity that's meant to feel kind of like witchy and spooky. Um, and it's meant to and. And that mechanic's actually like the main um, like unlock kind of mechanic that you see a lot. Ooh, and then this is where we are. Okay, so I think first of all, this is like just really, really masterful level design, um, where it's kind of utilizing like the absurdity of the world building here um, to give you actually a really nice vista. Like this is the this is the best view you get of the entire island. And then after this, the actual the in-game map actually isn't very good, um, or I found it kind of near useless. But from here, you know, you get a really good sense of like the whole space. You know, this is like this is like a vista view. Uh, you know, this is the level design construct we've talked about a lot in past streams, where um, it's the part of a level where you get to see where you're about to go for like the next 20 minutes. Here you get to see where you're about to go for like the next 10, 15 hours. So, you know, it's like a mega vista. Uh, and I don't think, I think open world games don't really do this. This is more almost like a battle royale approach to get offering you the vista, right? Um, it's kind of a shame though that we don't get to do the battle royale style drop though. I mean, you get this a little bit, but you'll see there's not much air control here. But you do get a little bit of, yeah, like a Fortnite Apex Legends vibe here, where you get to drop down and the music foods in, like feeds in. And I think that's what also, you know, this game is supposedly like 90s. Dreamcast Vaporwave throwback, but game design wise, it's actually very contemporary. Not just for the Battle Royale connections, but the idea that you're just doing like a like an indie open world game. The thought of making an indie open world game would have been impossible without the asset store infrastructure we have now. But now it's actually like fairly doable, actually. I mean I'm I'm attempting actually to make a indie open world game myself. Um, so it's actually not that terrible. Um, let's see, what's going on here? Uh, so we have these giant golden doors here. Uh, let's keep going. Oh, hello, Kara. Or Kara, sorry. <laughs> uh... So a lot of the level design in this game is just about like looking around these little cabinets and then like picking up blood crystals and blood crystals are like the main uh, currency resource in this game. Um, and that's actually where I think a lot of the level design here uh, kind of does a soft fail. I'll complain about it more when we get into the inner open world there. Um, where I was a little bit upset in their approach to that. Um, but, oh, I have to talk to this person. This person, Lydia, is like, it's like the cool, spunky best friend you have, who also has like a really cool interdimensional crystal car. I kind of want to play a spin-off where it's just this Lady Love Dies character and Lydia Daybreak, and you just go on like a Thelma and Louise, like, uh, like road trip. But anyway, okay, so the game just pulled like a soft kind of level design trick where we um, we had a really big vista and we saw those big golden gates. That's where you end the game, basically. Um, Kara, <laughs> never change. Um, okay, yeah, the, the the goat with tits can also come to the <laughs> can also go on the road trip. Go get him LD. LD as in level design? Oh, look at that. 
Oh, wait, okay, tutorial's still not over. Okay, I have to talk to this character. And this is where the climax of the game is. Except it doesn't, I don't know, I personally actually felt like it didn't end up feeling very climactic a little bit. Because um, by then you kind of know so much about how the case is going to go. Um, but anyway, yeah, I'm just going to, I'm not going to pause to read just because... Again, if you want to play, you should definitely purchase this game with money and and then play in earnest because it's 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 a really great game, I think. Um, you know, it, like like that's what's also really cool about doing this, working in this open world battle royale AAA tradition, where. Again, the design here, it's like, it actually, like, the game, like, lies to you in a lot of different interesting ways. Um, well, I mean, it's not the game lying to you necessarily, it's like characters lying to you. So just from a general game design perspective, um, this game kind of, like, doesn't treat you like a child. It actually bombards you with so much information, makes you sort through all this information, and then you kind of have to like act on hunches when you're questioning people. Um, it's pretty great. Okay, now now the game actually has its um, kind of Skyrim moment where you walk outside and now you're confronted with the giant open world. So this is like the second vista view we get. Very specifically set up and composed, right? We get the pyramids, that's where the gods live. Uh, we get this demon right here, that's to remind us to seek out this character and talk to them for like, little hints. Um, they're to remind us to uh, get blood crystals. But uh, let's let's look at round at some of these landmarks here. So, um, so over there we get to see where we were ex where we were serving our exile, right? Like up there, and like any AAA video game would have so much trouble justifying why there's like a giant like a uh, like cat tower, and then like a ho like a resort on top of a giant metal cat tower, right? Um, you know, no, like, no AAA video game would ever be brave enough to be this absurd and surreal with their world design. I think maybe like Ace Team or something, but, you know, you can argue they're indie and not like a thousand person Assassin's Creed teams. Um, what else should we look at here? Let's see. Uh, I'm a big fan of it's it feels very like Vegasy to me. Um this is something that um, the famous book uh, by, uh, I believe, uh, the postmodern architect Venturi about uh, learning from Las Vegas, um, where he argues that Las Vegas is a really good example of postmodern architecture because it's so much about the iconography, and the iconography is also like literally the structure as well. Um, and those landmarks are just made to be seen from like a mile away. So it's like super literal in like a funny, playful way. And that's kind of how the architecture here works, right? That's literally like a Lux, that's like the Luxor Hotel over there, right? Um, and over there, that's like some weird like Tesseract crystal or that machine from Contact or something, right? Um, and over here we get like some kind of like, like eight, very 80s, like brutalist hotel or something reminds me a lot of like older buildings in Singapore, uh, or even kind of like Mexico City a little bit. Um, so it feels like a resort town, but like a Vegas resort town where there's, there's just these giant monumental structures where it's like you see like a cheeseburger far off in the distance, and that's what that's what that place is right in Vegas and also in here. Anyway, let's just keep walking around. So with the open world structure, I think 
Um, so you'll notice here that with the open world structure, there's like several like ways you can go about structuring the opening pacing of the player. Um, the typical thing is usually to start the player in the middle of the map. So then you can kind of have some predictability about the distances, about kind of like where they'll be going a little bit. You know, every point, if you start in the middle, every point on the outer skirts is like equidistant from the middle. So, um, you know, stuff like uh, stuff like uh, Breath of the Wild, for instance, basically starts you in the middle of the map, right? Where you can, in theory, kind of choose where you want to go. And it's meant to like push the idea of freedom. Um, but... Um, and, and then here, I think they follow in the same vein, where we basically start in the middle, the downtown kind of of the map here. Uh, there's so much of that. We don't, we're only actually seeing half the map. This back half of the map is uh, covered by the mountain and all this other stuff. But I think uh, if you look at other stuff, look at other open world games, um, the alternative is something more like Subnautica, where you don't really start in the middle. The middle is like the halfway point of the game, actually. Uh, where you kind of more start in like an off center kind of zone, and you kind of have to orbit around the middle. Um, that's not what re that's not really what this game does, unfortunately, um, or fortunately, I don't know. But I think when I was first playing, this is just what I was marveling so much here, where right, you're here, you're like, it's like, where do you go now? You're offered two choices in the beginning of this game. You can either go down there and look at all that stuff, or go up here and see what's up there. Now, this is where like weird game theory happens, right? Let, okay, well, let's talk some game theory here. Um, you know, I think so. I think common conventional wisdom among the level designers is that because the player offering the player such a big vista here with all this stuff here, this will seem more important, obviously, and more along the critical path. And that's why you would predict most players would go down here. But I think this is also where audience matters a lot, right? Um, like, I'd really want to see the telemetry and analytics and heat maps for this game if they're collecting any of that data. Because I have a hunch that a large minority of players would actually go up this ramp. And actually, I went up this ramp at first, too. Because I think the logic there is that if you're like a gamer type who's into anime, who's into Unreal-powered open-world games on your PC or something, you feel like, okay, down there's where I'm supposed to go, so I shouldn't go down there first. I should go up here first, do the whatever side area, side quest thing is here, and then I'll backtrack and go down there and actually join the critical path. Which is to say that it's really hard to predict what the player will do. Like, I don't know. It could be like a 50-50 split. It's almost like even impossible to even predict like what that line of logic is. But then what's kind of funny about this is that They kind of anticipate that you're going to do that. My new name is One Last Key. That's and then, like, suddenly this, like, cool, like, cat lady ghost with a golden mask, like, appears to you and challenges you to find her, like, murderer. And then you're just like, what the heck is going on? I haven't even met any other characters yet. And then you're just walking up here and you're like, wait, this isn't a side area. This is actually like an actual like complex end game area almost. Where like, oh, okay, you go inside the opulent ziggurat. And then this is where all the blood sacrifices happen because part of the lore of this island is that uh, they farm humans to sacrifice to the gods and they sacrifice all the humans, thousands of humans, in a ritual sacrifice to power, like, their blood crystal interdimensional, um, like, wormhole technology or something. Um, but what's interesting about this, you know, I mean, you go in this, you go up here, it's really morbid, actually, kind of intense. But then this is actually pretty much gated off, if I believe. You go up here... Oh yeah, there's like some kind of puzzle, I forget. 
This is where it feels very uh dreamcasty. I forget what the solution to this is. I think it's gonna be painful. I think that was undoing my progress. Oh my god. Uh and then this one? Oh my god. Oh, this is gonna be okay, I'm just gonna rage quit that. I think we don't have time for that. I'm just gonna leave. Um they do this um they do this double door th trick here. I I believe this double door thing here it helps make it feel monumental, right? Like where there's like two giant sets of golden doors. But you know, this is also like a classic line of sight blocker where now that I'm on this side, you can safely turn off all the visibility calling on the other side of those doors, right? Because now I have no line of sight into there. And I believe when I'm doing that, when I'm like slicing the pie like this, you can catch a glimpse of that weird flicker. I believe that might be, you can see the sky kind of through that. At least that's my hunch. Anyway, yeah, I'm a big fan of big, sexy golden doors. Uh, let's keep walking around. Oh, there's a day-night cycle, you know, just like any proper open world game. All these creepy, like, cryptid statues. Like, multiple arms with, like, animal heads. What's cool about this is that by the end of the game, you can, like, actually identify what all the gods are. Because you'll be, like, familiar with the whole world of the game. Where am I supposed to go? Okay, let's walk down here. Yeah, I think I need to... Okay, um, people were saying that they actually didn't even have to do the puzzle in there because they di unlocked the sprint jump and double jump. And that's actually probably the biggest game design problem with this entire game, where double jump and the sprint jump are just so important to this game and your progression and how you move through this open world and then they kind of discourage you against getting those power-ups so this is going to be the mild big mild spoiler i offer but it's because i think this spoiler is important And that spoiler is just game design wise, this is where they really messed up, I think. Which is that these footbath things right here, these footbaths are your main upgrade progression thing in this entire game. And they unlock really, really important movement upgrades. And then you go up to them and the text you get instead is, do you want to relax in the footbath? Like, no hints about whether it's actually important or not. And it's really, it seems like such a conscious choice on their part to, like, downplay the importance of the footbath. It's really strange to me why they did that. I really don't get that. But sure. this is the double jump. I really need to, I need to find two more crystals so I can go unlock that double jump. Um, I need to find one more. Oh, there we go. Okay, there we go. So now... And now I have double jump, and now you can actually, like, go places. And it just completely changes the level design and flow of everything now that you have double jump. Um, it's just so funny that, like, they didn't... That they kind of discourage you from using the footbaths. It's just, I think, a really critical problem in the core game design here. And it's... I think the common experience is that most players, you get in like two or three hours into the game and then you're like, oh, gee, this is really slow and you're hoarding all your blood crystals. And then finally, you read my tw Twitter rant about this and you're like, oh, I should actually use the footbaths. 
And then you unlock all the movement upgrades. Anyway. In general, okay, my other spoiler piece of advice for this game is make sure you, um... There's actually, in practice, a lot of blood crystals in this game. Um, you should, um, spend blood crystals freely. Um, on everything except, um, except fast travel. You have to pay... Uh, blood crystals for fast travel um, that you should be a little bit stingy on but everything else you should always spend blood crystals on like everything you see because you'll have like 40 extra blood crystals by the end of the game if you're playing it like a typical Skyrim type gamer uh, okay so we should go back to the level design though that's enough of a rant about this um, Let's see, one thing I like is about how the environment feels super dynamic. Um, the use of... The use of lighting here is really, really nice. It actually feels very dynamic in a way that I think only... Basically only maybe Rockstar in the Grand Theft Auto games understands how to like light spaces dynamically for day-night stuff. I think many other like open world studios this is kind of where they falter where you can't it, there's a tendency to just build everything in daytime mode and never actually make use of that day night cycle um so it's pretty cool how they do make good use of that and this game actually gets appropriately creepy which i think is super cool um the resort ends up this giant marble resort like alien pyramid thing ends up feeling like uh oh, this is like weird where am i why is everything so dark i'm lost i don't know where i am um and if you've ever been in like some terrible like beach resort thing that's kind of how they feel like you're just wandering these em empty like creepy places it's like not actually relaxing you know that's the key behind something like the shining right the shining understands that like rich people places are actually way too big and like wealth itself is like horrifying and scary in a way and alienating um let's see um uh in the chat gripsack asks um do i mean being stingy do i mean fast travel like actually traveling or unlocking each station so um yeah, that's actually... Let me show you the fast travel mechanic in this game. Oh my god, I'm so lost. I have no idea where to go. So, around the game, they also have these fast travel stations right here. These bright magenta things. That's another thing I love about this game. Magenta is traditionally the color you use to signal that something is broken in the game engine. And in this game, magenta is like actually like the critical path color that you need to follow, like the mirror's edge red color, um, which I think is awesome. Like do that. Okay, so these are the save game stations where you can like save stuff. Oh, there's my save games. Don't look at that. Um, but there's also these unlock fast travel things where you have to spend one blood crystal just to unlock it. And then um, you also have to spend one additional crystal to fast travel somewhere else. Um, in practice, once you unlock all the movement upgrades, fast travel actually isn't even that good. But um... Oh, and then in the chat, uh, Karachan suggests maybe these footbaths should be free. I think I would kind of agree with that. I think... I don't know. Hmm... I think if they were free, you should hide them a little bit better. Because right now they're in central areas. I think I would hide them a little bit better if they were free. But I think I agree with the overall idea that they should be free. Um, and they are rare. Um, okay, so briefly I want to talk about this. This is the central hub area of the entire island where you're going to kind of be returning to a lot and crisscrossing over and over. And what's interesting about this is that it's relatively open, right? It's a relatively open plaza. But what's cool about this is that the gardens themselves are kind of spooky and you get lost very easily uh, because of all this foliage right here. 
where it's almost kind of like this witness vibe with these like a uh, Joshua tree kind of things here. And you can kind of get lost in the foliage and then you're not even sure where you're going. And then all these buildings look kind of similar, right? Here, this is like a giant brutalist concrete building. This is another concrete brutalist thing. And then this is leading to like another concrete brutalist thing. It all kind of blends in together, especially like these bu buildings. They look like anonymous like office complexes. So it's kind of disorienting in a funny way. Let's keep going though. <clears throat> uh, so we go down here and then the environment art approach changes a lot. Before it's kind of a lot of this brutalist stuff. And now we're entering these kind of like tower blocks here. These like apartment blocks. Uh, I, I guess these are more like condos almost. Um, and it's kind of cool how you're signaling these like different, um, these are both nominally 80s concrete brutalist structures, but you know, this is more like, I don't know, Coney Island, Brighton Beach. No, wait, no, I don't know what this makes me feel like. But the massing on this is so interesting, right? You get a lot of these, 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 these like cool like cantilever kind of like things jutting out. So maybe it feels distinct enough. And then you get these Japan style like canals. So it's kind of this interesting mismatch, uh, not mismatch, mixed uh, mishmash of like different feelings. Oh. Oh, oh wait, no, I guess they do reuse the codex screen. It's so that all the characters are nagging you to like talk to them. Let's see. So we're still walking around these different like resort areas. There's a lot of cool set dressing here. <clears throat> Where there's like these random ads. Oh, there's the there's the goat lady that Kara <laughs> Ellison is super into. Um, let's see what else is here. A lot of nice reuse of these foliage assets. That's kind of what ties into that like vaporwave. It, but also like slightly solar punk kind of feel to it. And now we're entering like a different segment of the oh here's another foot baths, I think. Is this a foot baths? No, it's not. My bad. No, the other foot baths is right here, but we don't have enough blood crystals to unlock it. Um oh wait, I'm like gated here. Okay, this is another section actually that kind of confused me when I was playing. It's like teaching you that some gates are locked, so then you have to follow the do these like power cable puzzles and then it shows you now that the gate is unlocked and then it's like a tutorial for how these gate things work which makes you think that there's going to be a lot more complicated gate locked gate puzzles later in the game but there actually isn't really it's just kind of this strange gate that kind of stops you for no reason um oh I don't know why I picked that up. That was just like a shiny bobble to pick up. Oh my god. What are these nags? Uh, in the chat, Morimo says uh, the UI is very interesting. Yeah, uh, I think I would concur with that. I just said I was lost and the NPC is telling me where to go. Um... Yes, yeah, so this is like a Metal Gear Solid inner UI, codec UI. But then a lot of the other, like, all these, like, wipes and stuff are very, like, Persona 5-ish, I think. 
Uh, the game knows I'm lost and is telling me to use the wayfinding thing. Ugh. Where do I go? Oh. This is kind of interesting. It's like... So I tried to go through there over to Nii's apartment blocks, but the way they structured everything with this giant canal here, it's actually kind of complicated to traverse. So there's a lot of friction. They, This is kind of like this soft gate where they're just frustrating you so much, they're trying to funnel you into this little sewer room. And they're trying to funnel you into this sewer room so that you go here and talk to the goat lady with the great rack. Uh, because she's kind of like a she's kind of like a secondary best friend character in this game uh, for you to talk to, and she's also kind of the built-in uh, hint system in this game, where you can pay her blood crystals to get hints. But again, I'm just gonna kind of hurry through this because oh my god, we're we need to see more of the island. I've barely, we've barely seen any of it. Again, check out the game. Play it seriously. But I just want to show you the island here. Notice the magenta ladder, right? So that you notice it. But maybe it's kind of scary. Uh, and then over here, we li we see where the humans live. Um, and this is where I think I have a very mixed reaction to this, where on one hand, the typology of the different housing blocks is super cool, where oh, we saw those luxury apartments where it was like cantilevered condos and stuff. And then here we get like a very like outskirts of Tokyo tiny apartment little houses with like tiny little gates and what's kind of cool about this is how cramped it, it feels <clears throat> where you enter into these little yards and when you can turn on the water for some reason i never found out why you can turn on the water um but it's kind of cool how it you're you're just like funneled into these tiny little yards here in these little alleys <clears throat> and it's kind of unpleasant to navigate which i think is a good thing because it helps you Ooh, i'm getting hiccups it helps you uh imagine what it would be like to like live as a human in this fictional world you'd be living in one of these shitty little apartments i mean they're not that shitty but small and um, you'd have like a little stretch of yard and this is all you would get. And you'd be crammed and living in this building with like 10 other people, right? So like, I think from like a big picture, the way they're the different like, um, like, like the different traversal and experiences and like the different scales where sometimes this island is so wide open and sometimes it gets really compressed and small um, is really, really good. It's, um, I think, just feels really smart to me in a way that a lot of open world games are just either... Either they kind of have to bow to this weird like Assassin's Creed collect-a-thon kind of thing or um, they have to make the open world so big that they don't have enough time and resources to actually lovingly set dress and put detail into the individual areas. So for an open world game, this is actually kind of small. Like you can see the whole open world of this game within like four or Maybe like four or five hours, you you can probably see the entire island at that point. Um, and you'll be vaguely familiar with it. So the scale of this is, I think, just really, really cool. It's really inspiring because it's like, yeah, I could see myself making like an open world indie game that's about this size. Uh, maybe a little bit smaller. It almost feels a little bit too big sometimes. 
like they run out of steam a little bit. Let me show you where I think they run out of steam. Oh, the convenience store is really cute. I like this. And then this little mascot is super cute too. I wish open world games were smaller and denser. I think that's kind of the lesson of Paradise Killer overall. Uh, oh, I need to go over to this other bridge. So all the built-up urban areas in this game and the interiors of this game, I think, are super interesting. I think where the game, where you, I feel like the level designers or environment artists kind of ran out of steam. Oh, here's another footpath. Is these outdoor, like, in-between liminal spaces where there's no clear identity or task function here. Like, this is just, like, random bridges and hallways that connect between the town area and the warehouse area and it's kind of like they didn't really know what to put in here it's supposed to be kind of the scenic view but you can see even here it's kind of just kind of like unpolished as well like it's not as cool of a place to hang out in really it's just kind of this like glue kind of space and then over here, it feels unfinished and haunted um, in a way, in the same way that like Sonic Adventure is kind of creepy as well with these just random, it's like, it's like the empty corner of like a mall in like Indianapolis or Ohio, where there's just like, not all the storefronts are vacant and no one's been there in a long time and it's clean but because it's it's clean because like the ghosts are there. Anyway, uh, we're in this warehouse area. This warehouse area, I think, is probably the most gamey the level design gets to me, I think. Where to me, this just feels like like a boring warehouse area. Like this isn't, this isn't a warehouse of a demonic god apocalypse death cult culture, right? This is just like, a warehouse with like pipes and like and like these doors um and it just feels very boxy and then there's this like crane puzzle that is kind of a little bit baffling and inexplicable and doesn't really matter um right like at least you could do okay so the bioshock approach to making to like a jazzed up warehouse is to put really weird stuff inside the boxes so Usually, you know, like in like in Bioshock 1, you go through like a smuggler hideout, which is just a cave warehouse, basically. But when you look inside the boxes, oh my god, they're smuggling Bibles inside the boxes. Oh, this is like a weird Bible smuggling warehouse. Okay. But then here, they don't make that same gesture, right? Like, it's kind of a missed opportunity where you could have been like, oh, like, what... What do gods need stockpiled exactly? Like are all these boxes full of just like caviar or like candles or something? Like what do what does like a, what does like goat head lady want? You know. So this is to me. I feel like it's such an obvious direction to go with the set dressing, environmental storytelling. That to me, this feels like an area that they just didn't get have enough time to come back to, to actually make more interesting. Like they did an initial like gameplay pass on it, and then they scattered the crates everywhere, and then they had to move on to some other place. I think what also contributes to this unfinished feeling is that yeah, it just feels kind of like. Yeah, there's all this random foliage here. If everything feels spaced out, but in an empty, unfinished way, not in like a very intentional way, right? Uh, then let's walk over here. This area, I kind of like. But it kind of suffers from a similar problem where it's kind of gamey in a way that isn't super interesting and it's a little disappointing compared to the other areas where this is like a farm area 
where they like grow all the food for the humans, I believe. That's the lore here. And the main puzzle of this area is that you need to collect something down here. But to collect something down here, you need to fill up the water for this area and flood all these canals. But to flood these canals, you have to find all the like valve wheels. But to even know that you need to find the valve wheels, you need to climb up this kind of annoying to get to tower because la these ladders kind of feel sloppy. Um, and then here's where you see, oh, okay, I need to find three handles and bring them here. And then that's the lock that unlocks everything. So that's the main puzzle of this area. Like walking around here and trying to like slice the pie behind these cramped like little plant features and like trying to find whatever looks like the valve wheel thing yeah are these no these aren't weed plants and then there's our valve wheel there's valve wheel number one and yeah it's like okay it just feels a little bit i don't know could be better. Um, but the typology, the overall like layout and flow on this is interesting because first of all, you have these canals that you're dipping into and then these cool like stairwell bridges that bridge over it. So it feels like very industrial and kind of researched in a cool way. Like this feels like, yeah, this feels like a contemporary industrial farm with like modern technology, right? Oh wait, I have double jump. I should use that. So my one beef with this area is that there's just one, the way to get back up is you need to, the only way back up is that random ladder that's hard to see that leads back up to that causeway up there. And the other way up is this really painful stairwell ramp, right? So it's just like, okay, I guess I'll, like going up a lot of stairs is just kind of, annoying a little bit and it feels a little bit drawn out so i can see why they did that a little bit it's to kind of encourage you to stay and linger in this area so you want a lot of easy downward momentum right it's so easy for me to jump down there if i want to and see what's up but to go back up there's a lot of friction going back upwards where there's only that stairwell or this random ladder over here that is hard to notice so that's there to encourage you, I think, to stay in this area and solve that valve wheel puzzle and not to try to like come back later. In terms of the narrative design though, the clue you unlock from it, I think isn't super critical. It's just like of like moderate importance. Um, okay, let's see going on here uh okay here's another critique i would have here where there's this cool structure this is like a oh i forget what this is called this is the power factory this is where all the power on the island comes from and it's powered by this like probability quantum mechanism here giant cr blood crystal thing so then you think there's going to be a cool section of the game where you get to go inside, but it actually never fulfills that promise. It's only just this outer shell that you never actually get to go in, which is kind of disappointing, but well, let's use the fast travel here. I think I can use this to go back to the center.
Hey, we're back to the middle of the island. Uh, so we explored all of that other side. Um, I think I want to talk a little bit about the beach area. So the beach areas, I think, are one missed opportunity here. Uh, I was talking about how that canyon waterfall area back there was kind of like incomplete and didn't feel super great to me. And I think the beach area also falls under that kind of problem where it feels kind of structureless here. It's just kind of this, I mean, in one way, this is realistic, right? Um, beaches in real life in like resort towns are just stretches of sand and you go there and hang out. I mean, I don't know what else you could deck. I mean, there's some statues here. But then after you see one statue, you, all the statues end up kind of like blending in together. And then they end up feeling like unique locations. Or not feeling like unique locations. So let's just walk along this beach here. So it feels like a little bit of a missed opportunity to me. Just because I think you could do like a lot more with how beaches functioned in this society. Like it's like a vacation island, but like, I don't know, like not all beaches are the same, right? Like beaches should feel kind of distinct. Like, like look at this, this is just like an empty stretch of like the landscape terrain. So I guess the end result of that is it kind of discourages you from going on the beaches. I guess you're not supposed to go on the beaches because there's really not even many like collectibles or pickups here for you. Oh, a severed arm. There's like a few clues you can find that are like hidden along the beaches, but I think the one beach area that does feel good is uh, these like obelisks, kind of. And then this especially feels very Sonic Adventure to me. And over here we see like a lot more uh, set dressing where it's like, okay, let's imagine what people did on this beach. Okay, I guess this was more of the beach side of the beach where people liked hanging out on. So now we get like all these like towels and beach chairs. Uh, we get this like ferry service thing. This is a little bit confusing because um, the fiction behind this little area is that this is a boat trip. This is like a little ferry dock for boat trips that go around the island. But as far as I can tell, there aren't... Oh god, how do I get out of this screen? There aren't... I don't think I see... I've seen any more of these stations anywhere else on the island. There might be one or two other ones. I don't even remember. But as far as I can remember, this is the only one. So that feels like a missed uh, loose end that you, you didn't quite come back to. Where there's there's no actual like fake diegetic ferry boat structure for this island. Uh, let's see what else is going on here. This is probably the nicest beach area where there's like a good mix of um, this like built area that's like stretching out into the beach and kind of activating the beach. And then this ramp kind of spirals like in and out and under itself, which is cool. Like I like how this sneaks around and then kind of gets you to take this uh, sight line out towards these obelisks, which which end up being slightly important later on. But. 
You know, this feels like an actual place, I think. Meanwhile, the other beaches felt like non-places, I think. Um, what's also cool about this area is that it has a little bit of some Skyrim rock jumping. Um, I think the best part of... I think the true legacy of Bethesda-style open-world level design is jumping on the rocks that border along the world, along the game worlds. It's just so much fun to be like, can I jump on this rock? Okay, I can like make, it's, it's kind of a metaphorical rock climbing, right? Like, oh, I can make my way and jump up here. Okay, cool. Can I like cheese my way up this cliff? Okay, I'm gonna do this. And then the game kind of anticipates you doing that and be like, oh, actually, here's a clue that you should look at. But you can just like double jump around. And there's a little collectibles for you to find. Let's see. I do wish there was a gliding mechanic. Well, there's the sprint jumping mechanic. That's kind of the same thing. Let's go around to the other side of the island. And then that's probably the end of our hour, I think. Oh, we're snaking back here. Hmm. Let's go over here. I think the Skyrim jumping feeling is what I like about the traversal in this game, where it's it kind of wants you to cheese its own terrain. It's more relaxed. It's not like a Rockstar open world, which to me feels like kind of like I don't know, stabilized to death? Where there's no weird, like, glitches you're supposed to find? You won't get stuck in places? Here, I, I feel like you can almost definitely get stuck. When you, like, accidentally fall in the wrong way and get wedged somewhere. I'll take this elevator. I think I just want to show you one last location, and I think then we'll end for today. Uh, where is it? I think it's over here. So, up there's the murder scene. That's where you actually have to go to like investigate what happened. But let's just ignore that and go over here to this side area. So, this side area is like pretty cool, pretty built up and unique. Feels pretty designed and specific in what they're going for. Where this is like a ramp that's spiraling up. A giant crystalline effigy of a god. With these cool like golden skull cauldrons that are fairly unique to this area.
But then each one, it's using repetition in a really interesting way, where it's kind of trying to get you to recognize these statues. Like each little platform or landing for this ramp is kind of dedicated to a different god. And then when we go up here... We kind of get up to here, to this giant multi-armed one true goat god. Or silent goat, sorry. Um, and what's kind of cool about this is that it kind of shows you what the hierarchy of the god pantheon in this world is. So this is where the verticality and the flow of the level design is also intertwined with the uh, environmental storytelling and lore. Because at the very top, here we see the silent goat, which is kind of like the Zeus of this god pantheon in this game. Um, I believe the silent, silent god, uh, the silent goat is the one that like creates this island and all that stuff. So of course they get to go at the very top. Um, and it's just kind of cool about how you come up here and then you expect like a bunch of treasure up here. But there's actually like nothing. There's one random codex entry and there's one blood crystal here. And then you're just standing here and you're like, what do I do now? Right? Um, and I liked how there's like two beats that happen here. One beat is like, oh wait, should I just be going to cool places without expecting any reward? Maybe that's okay. And that that's... That's what I like about some of the level design collectible sensibility here, where important areas often don't have that many resources or pickups. But then the randomest hidden side areas will have a bunch of blood crystals hidden there for you to pick up. Um, so it's kind of the opposite of a typical AAA open world game where they're always breadcrumbing everything for you and trying to play supply caches in important places. Here it's like the opposite where they really want you to have this more intrinsic relationship with the environment where you want to look at this statue just because you think it's cool to look at this statue, right? You're not here in hopes of finding an upgrade. You're here because you want to pay your respects. You want to give an F in the chat to this silent goat god, right? Okay, so that's one beat, I think, that happens when players climb this spire, right? They come up here, and then there's actually not much formal gameplay affordance to do. Now, the second gameplay beat that happens when you're up here is you're like, well, I climbed up here, I don't want to waste all my effort that I just spent. I just spent 30 whole seconds climbing up this ramp um, what do I do now? And then the player, I think, a lot of players end up looking over here and then you're like, oh wait, this is actually perfect for me to get on top of this building here. And now you can go over here and find all these pickups. And then there's actually like some extra clues for you to unlock over here that thing, whatever that thingy is. And then there's like another clue somewhere over here. Um, so then it's kind of this fake out where it's like, haha, you came up here and looked at the God statue cause you just thought it was cool and I'm not gonna give you an actual reward. But then you look over the side of the platform and you're like, oh actually I can jump down to here and there's a bunch of stuff I can pick up now. And it's like, haha, psych, you can actually, it was actually very helpful for you to jump up here because that gave you a good vantage point to jump down here. Um, so it's like, it's like a, there's like several beats, I think, in that like movement traversal encounter that are kind of cool. Um, in the chat, Pascal Plus asks, do you feel like the movement speed complements the scale of the environment? Oh, what was that? Oh, right, you can find liquor. Um, yeah, I think, I think the movement speed is nice because it helps cement. Yeah, someone earlier, uh, Wild Peak says it's like a dreamlike gravity. I think the movement feel of this complements the uh, 
definitely complements kind of the aura and like vibe of this game, right? It's kind of a loose, casual, hangout, jump around game, right? It's not like what remains of Edith Finch or like Dear Esther, right? Where it's like a capital W walking simulator. Here it's kind of like, oh yeah, walk around if you want, but also jump around if you want. But also, oh, what happens if you try to like jump down there? Or like, what happens if you try to, can you like make it on top of that building from here? I don't know, maybe let's try that. I'm gonna try to. Ah, yeah, I kind of made it. Ah, well, get me, let me get over this whip though. Oh no, I accidentally jumped. Oh no, ah. So, right, I would say this is like a lowercase w walking simulator, or you might even also call it a platformer, given how much jumping and traversal you do in this game. <laughs> Um, maybe the one, okay, so one drawback with this movement speed and their approach to the level design, I think relates to a comment someone made in the chat earlier, where the design of the collectibles is kind of annoying. They're these pixelated, glittery, uh, like, sprites that are very much just screaming, hey, I'm a collectible, come over here and pick me up. And that's, that feels, where so much of the world design feels to me so subtle and, like, natural and cool and smart this feels like they gave up a little bit where they knew they needed people to notice things the players jumping everywhere so fast you need to catch the player's attention so fast that the collectible design is just like shrugging and being like yeah pick up the sprite yeah it's just a sprite you're picking up a sprite with some text attached to it so what big whoop but it's a little bit sad to give up like that, but also understandable to give up like that, given again, the scale of this game for three people is just really, again, stunning. And I just wanna return back to that. We've been doing so much nitpicking <laughs> a lot with this. I do wanna reiterate that overall, I think the world design and level design in this is really good and solid, um, but I think it's just, yeah, I just always had these nagging doubts as I was walking around like, oh, what if this was slightly better? Or, oh, what if they had just one more level designer helping out on this project? Or, oh, what if they just spent one more month, like, tightening all these spaces? You know, it would feel like just a little bit better. Anyway, um, that's pretty much the whole island. I haven't shown you any of the individual residences or anything, but... I've showed you kind of most of the major areas to give you like kind of a vibe of how the level design in this game worked out. And um, overall, again, really good game. Please play it. It's like a solid 10 to 12 hour mystery game that will not waste your time, except maybe near the end where you might feel like you're wasting your time going back and forth a lot. But otherwise, Solid game. I do not regret playing it. And um, here's hoping that a lot of people play this and get inspired by it. I want to see a lot more medium, small to medium sized open world games. I think that's like a promising genre, uh, like an untapped space that I think indies can kind of capitalize on a lot more. It's a space where AAA will stay out of. Um, but it's still kind of the vibe that gamers would want from like a commercial product. So, um, I don't know. Anyway, that's just my opinion. Anyway, um, thank you everyone so much for watching again. Sorry, this is the last stream of the year because starting next month, um, I have to try to, oh yeah, Outer Worlds is definitely a really good medium sized open world game and Sludge Life. Oh, I should play Sludge Life. Okay, maybe Sludge Life next year when, I, when I'm set up in New Zealand and have my streaming, I have all my streaming gear and everything all set up again. Um, but we'll see how long it takes. Anyway, 
thanks everyone for hanging out and in the meantime see you around on the internet and uh oh another reminder uh remember there's a bunch of other streamers who also stream level design uh remember uh jp go breton who works uh double fine on psychonauts so working level designer also does wad wednesdays wednesday nights i think 7 p.m pacific uh where uh jp plays a bunch of ra random doom maps which is always really fun to see uh oh yes and quasi otter in the chat also streams a bunch of quake maps and there's a lot of actually quake mapper design streams actually so definitely check that out all right um i'm gonna sign off for real now have a good one everyone good luck out there hopefully we will survive november bye